Hey, good morning. Welcome back to day two of operational budget discussions for the 2015 to 2018 budget cycle for the city of Grand Prairie. Um, we're up to the community growth service area and uh, Ms. Kata Sharp, I think you're going to lead that for us. Yes, thanks very much, Mayor Given. Um, I'm here to talk about community growth and we're referencing communications and citizen engagement, economic development and corporate web management, environmental stewardship, geographic information systems or GIS, planning and development, and revolution place. Um, and we're doing things just a little bit differently because that's what we do. We thought we would throw our, our numbers up, up right away to use as a point, of, so council can use as a point of reference, and then we can come back. Of course, these will all be shown um, in each of the individual budget presentations for this particular service area. So challenges going forward, and when, you, when we use the word challenges, that's not necessarily a negative thing. It can be a very, very positive thing. And when we see the Citizen Contact Center right up there at, at, uh, at, the, at the top, um, of course, that is uh, a new service that has just been provided and open within the last few weeks. And just to let everyone know, it is operating from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day. We're currently averaging 35 calls a day. And the focus has been on signing people up to a windrow program, questions about change in the snow removal policy. Uh, began November 10th with general inquiries, and then uh, it is eventually being paired with transportation services, and the mayor, city, the mayor and the city manager's office. Transit comes on board on Friday, enforcement services online Monday, and at peak times we'll have three customer service reps at, uh, at the desk. And uh, the basic contact center has five seats. Other staff can be queued in for emergent needs. So, um, and, it, and it seems to be off to a really nice start and, and the intent um, um, will continue to grow and get better as we move along. Of course, annexation. Um, we have just very recently come through the hearings and we'll, are waiting the decision of the municipal governance board. A lot of work went into that particular program and there will be more regardless of the decision, we're of course hoping for things on the city side and that it works well for our neighbors as well. Long-term planning for economic development, our community is growing very, very quickly. You heard yesterday from Brian Glavin, our economic development officer, that um, it looks like what you might be at the 64,000 population for this year. And of course, with more people come more requests for services and we have to be ready for that and out in front of that as much as we can. Open Data is a, is a new program uh, for, the, for the city through uh, GIS, and it is, involves hundreds of GIS data sets being served up to the Open Data portal and available to the public, and includes updates to the portal and overall management of data going out. And um, it's anticipated that these data sets will be in demand as the existing is very much consumed by public and, um, and the folks who require that information. And then mobile workforce, um, we heard as part of our capital budget um, discussions last week that many of the inquiries coming through to our website, 55% of those are coming through mobile devices. So we need to keep up with that as well and, and continue to uh, meet and exceed the expectations of our customers. And then uh, Revolution Place, um, keep getting the, biz the building busier um, and making sure that we're bringing lots of people to the community um, so we can have a positive economic development impact to the business in this uh, area and region. So I uh, also use this slide as a point of reference for you as well, so it could all be in one location for you. Um, and again, this will be referenced throughout the individual presentations. So community growth overall, um, successes as a group, the industrial attraction strategy, our community mobility plan, um, GP Mobile, the history book being uh, published this year in, uh, in line with the 100th anniversary, the merger of planning and development uh, as a department, and uh, the Revolution Place Naming Rights Agreement. Challenges, of course, um, and again, good challenges, uh, growth and infrastructure constraints, um, keeping up, keeping ahead of the curve as much as we can. Uh, being aware of environmental issues, that's important to, uh, to council, and uh, so much so we have an environmental stewardship uh, department now. 
keeping up with changing technology, the demand for communication in a variety of platforms, and the annexation process and uh, revolution place expansion. So dealing with the director's budget, You will see from 2014 to 2015 that there is a decrease, um, the cross-charging for the internship program that the city is involved with, uh, with Alberta Municipal Affairs. There's a reduction in revenue. Um, the completion of the 100th anniversary program, so there'll be a reduction in expenses to the tune of $250,000. Um, as well, the city car, um, is being moved to a different budget that's going into environmental stewardship. And the director's salary has been maintained to cover recruitment and possible relocation costs for the new director when they come into the position. Councillor Rice? Well, that number that, that you're showing there, that 400 and whatever, that's not really an accurate number like it's gone down but it's really gone up if you take uh, if you take that okay, where's my chart? Um, if, if you take that 473 or whatever it is, 411 450 so if if you take off take off the 573 956 you take off all those things that you said are coming off, the car, the 100th anniversary, all that kind of thing, then the 573 would become what number? Because then the 411 is actually an increase, not a decrease. From core... So, core is, so, we're, so Councilor Rice, you're looking at page 11 in our green book? Is that kind of where you're going from? Well, I was going from page 149 in the slide. But okay, because okay. if you look at um, the detail on page 11, shows salaries in the department. I mean, this is exactly what you're saying. Salaries in the department 2014 are 400,000, just over. Uh, and in 2015, they're 425. And that's the, is that kind of the number that you're looking for? Because really, that, if you're just looking at salaries. Okay. Shows that the number actually is going up between 2014 and 2015. Yeah. That would make sense. My apologies so, for that. Yeah. So the question then for Councillor, I guess Councillor Rice's question is, what's the what's the difference in the, the twenty five thousand dollar difference? Okay. I'll I'll get that answer. Maybe. Okay. Well, I'll just flag it and we can get back to it. Yes. Okay. Okay, so for community growth overall, um, optimizing existing services, um, ensuring that we have significant partnerships in order to deliver our municipal services, uh, enhancing tourism. Um, of course, strengthening our core, a huge uh, focus for council, developing a vision and plan for downtown, enhancing community mobility, promoting residential development, and exploring al alternative models of land development. Balancing residential and non-residential development and developing residential infill strategies and capitalizing on our growth, planning to consider a full spectrum of services provided by the city and using best practice models to take advantage of industry trends. And we saw a number of those trends yesterday with Brian's presentation. Uh, invest in the infrastructure to meet the demands and future needs of our citizens and improve our planning documents in order to better prepare for that future. So the next department is communications and citizen engagement. And key services provided from this particular department our first point of information for the public, and again referencing the Citizen Contact Center, also provides consultation services to council and staff. The lead on corporate communications, managing social media and the number of platforms that now exist there. Media and general inquiries monitoring, 
uh, photography um, and public relations activities, and em emergency communications when the emergency operations center is activated. And you can see the resources that we have uh, allocated to that particular department right now. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Mayor and Bill. Uh, Jane, I'm looking at uh, page 13. Uh, it's a budget line sheet. Uh, between 2014 and 2015, there's a significant uh, change, about 84% in salaries. Um, is, how many people does that include to the uh, marketing and communications department? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Thiessen. Um, we can jump ahead and deal with it that on the slide what I can deal with that right now or on the slide that talks about the increase in the staffing levels at that time whatever you prefer so, so it's coming up in the presentation okay, okay. Um, I, another thing there's a number of other things that uh, this department is involved with um, from a corporate wide uh, perspective uh, Canada Day Santa Claus parades um, Facilitate and deploy citizen engagement activities, the recent citizen chat session that was very successful, um, and participates in different trade shows that are out there to promote the city of Grand Prairie. Councillor Rice. Canada Day, my understanding was that the bulk of those costs come through Muscatique Park. It's my understanding that we're talking about the communication piece of this and, and, and the involvement and making sure that that message is getting out. It's all part of that particular package. I, I don't believe that the budget piece is part of that. It's just that these are some of the programs that communications is involved with. So for example, is it the staff that coordinate the development of the city float and the stocking of it with uh, candies to give out that are, uh, that are in a service area? I think that's about the staff members that do that. I'm pretty sure they reside in the service area. Yes. And one other question. Uh, interdepartmental is taking a big jump. Pardon me, Council Race? Interdepartmental. Got a huge jump. Like triple over triple. What? I wonder if that may be related to the number of staff, because yeah. uh, aren't there interdepartmental charges with every computer? And so if you have more staff, you have more computers? Perhaps it would make sense if I deal with that right now, Mayor Gibbons. Let's, let's talk about that. Okay. So um, in terms of positions, um, this particular work uh, or department has requested um, a 0.5 communications coordinator, currently economic development and um, communications and en citizen engagement share one position, 0.5 for one work unit, 0.5 for the other work unit. So one of the asks is that um, that be 0.5 allocated to make this communications coordinator a full-time position in the communications department. The other um, ask is for um, an increase in the hours for customer service rep. We have an accommodation issue here, and that has uh, taken place in this particular department. And uh, we're asking that that position go from 14 hours a week to 20 hours a week. And then, of course, we have the staff in the Citizen Contact Centre, um, and that has been part of this year's budget as well and will be included into next year. Councillor Rice. So making that a full-time person in the communication department, does that mean then that person has gone away from economic development? Um, Councillor Rice, there still remains a 0.5 position in economic development and there will be a request to have an additional 0.5 asked. So economic development would also have a full-time position. Okay. Councillor Radman. <coughs> Thank you, Mary Gibbon. Just could I, um, when we're dealing with staffing, uh, I didn't print out the presentation, so I'm depending upon this from my presentation. Can we, can we get that slide up? I'm talking about staffing. Oh, certainly. Slide. Yeah, 
That's really cool. Thanks a lot. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions in regards to that? And I can move back to the other part of the presentation. Is anybody ringing in? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mary Gibbon. Okay. Successes, successes and challenges um, for communications and citizen engagement. Um, success is consultation services. More departments in the city are um, calling on uh, communications uh, and citizen engagement for assistance. Um, developing social media guidelines and practices and again trying to be consistent with that throughout our organization. Um, working very well together with our web team. Um, the citizen engagement program, uh, brand implementation and consistency in regards to that and the history book completion. Um, the challenges, of course, like so many others, um, staff resources and time um, to dedicate to the many things on folks' plate to make sure, again, we're proactive with communication and we are getting out in front of issues and making sure that our brand stays consistent across the organization. Provide a little bit more detail in terms of the proactive uh, communication. Um, uh, communications and citizen engagement uh, works with our corporate web management team. Uh, they meet weekly. There's a communicators network. Um, I'll be referencing the Citizen Contact Center a lot in this presentation um, because that's all part of the engagement and there has been much work done on that uh, communication standard manual and policy and of course the annual um, corporate communications plan. Engagement and information, um, it's critical that our residents feel they're receiving the right amount of information from us about programs and services provided and they have the opportunity to participate in that along with us. Uh, I see Councillor Royce had a question. Okay, so when I go back to that chart, uh, is it under the support, so would these would this be the department that if council has to bring greetings uh, they would research and write the uh, briefing notes yes councillor right oh. I must be going to the wrong people okay. councillor Clayton thank you Mary given I had already answered the question myself but I'm and um, Jane possibly you can help me out Currently in communication and citizen engagement, there's 2.5 employees, and we're looking to increase it in 2015 to 0.5. So can you tell me how many, in addition, there are temporary employment employees there are that take the phone calls from November 10th or whenever the, you know, the, the bulk of the snow questions come in? How many other additional temporary employees are there? Um, it's my understanding that these are full-time permanent employees, and I'm going to look to David for that. And there's two permanent. Okay, so that's where I'm confused. There's two permanent that take phone calls. There's 2.5 in communication and citizen engagement. And we're looking for another 0.5. So then will there be five or is there, there will be three? So, Councilor, just to appreciate what you're asking. So are we essentially asking where do the positions mm -hmm. for the citizen contact center exactly. reside? Yep. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, for sure. So where in the, where where do those staff show up in the you know in the, the different departments? I guess I just want to know the scope of that whole sort of citizen engagement and communication department, okay. including the snow question, the snow the citizen contact center. Citizen contact. Answer other questions too. Yes, yeah. Maybe not yeah. right now. It's but. still right now, but yes, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. See Councillor Terrence. I'm just uh, yeah, getting some clarification on here. So, uh, showing on the uh, staff establishment uh, chart here that uh, for communication and citizen engagement, it goes from 2.5 to 3.6, which I understand, and then it goes up to 5.6 in 2016. I'm just not seeing where that increases. Mm -hmm. Increase. 
it's because we've asked for the additional in uh, let me get back to you on that so I can clarify that more formally instead of fumbling on that so, uh, so maybe let's just flag that for additional information okay. so uh, in clarification uh, and it's really kind of the total staffing of that area is that, is that what we're looking for That's what I just said. Yeah. And I think Councillor Tarrant just did that. Okay. So we go on to the next uh, department. So, um, look at the budget for um, communications and citizen engagement. And the majority of the budget increase uh, is due from 2014 to 2015, uh, is due to the transfer of two salaries from enforcement services. There were vacancies there that they gave up to us uh, to support the citizen contact center. And again, the half-time communications position share between communications and citizen engagement and economic development um, with council's approval will be made full-time. And hours are being increased for a part-time customer service representative from 14 hours to 20 hours. There was anybody that wanted to ring in to request anything, or hey, Councillor Rice? Can I flag this, or, or do you want to flag specific items? Well, it's like you just are you looking for more information? I was wanting to discuss the increase of staffing costs. Okay, so we've got the total staffing in the citizen engagement uh, department has been flagged already. So, is there something in addition to that? That's good. Okay. Hey, Mayor Given, thank you very much. We move on to economic development and corporate web management. Of course, corporate web management, uh, uh, formerly strategic services, it was felt during the business planning this title change would more accurately reflect the work that our web team is doing and um, was a little clearer to our citizens than strategic services. So successes for this particular uh, department. Uh, there increased utilization of uh, website management expertise, the retail market analysis. Uh, it has been very well received by industry and is um, definitely assisting in attracting new retail development to Grand Prairie. Uh, the industrial attraction strategy uh, that was adopted by council has facilitated the review of fire flow standards, allocated investment funds for the construction of strategic wastewater infrastructure, and the consideration of alternative development standards in newly annexed areas. Growing the North Conference has become one of the highlighted events uh, in this neck of the woods, continues to be a major success, and the city's uh, been partnered in that event since day one. This year there was record attendance. Uh, the merger of the Economic Development and former Strategic Services Department was also uh, a major success when uh, the reorganization took place. So some of the challenges uh, remain um, keeping website and social media messaging consistent and ensuring that um, all departments are utilizing that consistent website format um, and that the information as well remains consistent across all channels. Uh, staffing turnover um, has led to some challenges um, and in this particular area employee housing um, difficulty in finding affordable housing for staff has become a bit of a problem and then public land use enforcement there are significant encroachment issues onto public land throughout our community um, which has led to a bit of a snowball effect with other folks doing some things as well and uh, expanding their own properties onto city property. So that does remain a challenge. So 
here is the budget for economic development and corporate web management. Um, it does jump um, for, um, by 9.6% in 2015, uh, lar largely due to the addition of a new position, and that would be the 0.5%. Um, full-time position would allow for enhanced productivity through specialization and dedicated resource allocation to economic development projects. Um, right now, the, um, the individual who is uh, sharing um, that is working in communications and economic development. We're working with competing priorities, and uh, this way there could be a more dedicated approach to that as well. In 2016, there is an adjustment for inflation, and in 2017, a decrease due to the ending of the Community Futures Youth Entrepreneur Grant. <coughs> that would be Entrepreneurship Grant. Left out part of the word, my apologies. Um, corporate web management. Um, the operational budget includes cost coverage for software and services that were previously covered by capital projects. And online services are typically renewed annually, and we're anticipating vendors increasing their license fee by approximately 3%. And programming support costs for existing projects were previously unbudgeted for, so they're also included in this operational budget. In 2017, the contract with Socrata for our open data portal will need to be renewed, and which will uh, it's reflected increases in 2017 and 2018. And in 2018, a graphic design position has been requested for the corporate web management team. See, Councillor Rice. In the um, uh, job responsibilities of economic development, I didn't pick out uh, management of city land. I saw that on one of the slides. Yeah, it's, oh, Mayor Given, it's actually um, included in the next slide, economic development and land management. That falls under the economic development okay, area. In that past slide, didn't no, it didn't. That. Right. That's correct. Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, Jane, could you remind me what the grants are, the grant increase in 2015? Sorry? All oh, right. Thank you. Never mind. Sorry, yeah, just uh, the, if Councillor, if we're providing information, let's make sure everybody hears it. Councillor Radburn. Thank you, Mayor Given. I think uh, Councillor Clayton was referring to the increase in uh, grants, economic, economic development from 214 to 215 is significant, and I believe that would be the tour of Alberta grant. Okay. You can confirm with that. Okay. Uh, looks like we've got a minute. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would like to flag the... Um, the uh, graphic design position um, in terms of the timing uh, starting in 2018. So I'd like to flag that for further discussion. Okay. Councillor Radburn. I mean, it's appropriate now. We're almost finished this section, I think. I'd like to flag uh, an item, and I'll call it uh, um, tourism initiatives, city tourism initiatives. And with that flag, I, I will speak to it with a, with a suggestion to test the appetite of council. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Councilor Redburn. And just uh, for everybody, uh, Got a couple of notes that uh, some may be having a difficult time hearing us on the webcast. So uh, just ensure your microphone sort of pointed down towards you and that uh, you do speak into it, uh, just so that uh, people can hear what's being said. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Mayor Bill. Um, Jane, I was just uh, wondering, uh, between 214 and 215, uh, there's about a $50,000 drop from salaries. Uh, did we lose people there? Or? Is that our standard page on council? Oh, sorry, page 16 on uh, green binder. Uh, corporate web management. Okay. 
Councilor Thiessen, are you referencing the actual costs? I uh, well, yeah. In 2014, you got 323,000 in salary, and then 2015, 273,000 in salary for a drop of almost 50,000. Um, I just was wondering if we were, because it looks like we're continuing on from 273, uh, and so that to me seems like standard staffing retention going over for the next two years until 2018, or is there's already a flagged item for the graphic designer, but did we lose somebody, or we're, are we working with less people up there? Or? We actually did lose uh, one person earlier this year um, who moved back to Kelowna. Um, I know that, that, I believe that position has been filled, but I can, um, I can check on that. But, there, and then we have also recently lost a, um, a person who went back to planning and development. That was also a, a recent move. So there's been certainly some movement there. Okay. Thank you. So just, just to clarify with those, so the positions still exist? Mm -hmm. So then, Councilor Thiessen's question is still sort of uh, appropriate because if the position exists, then it should be budgeted for. So I think the question is, why is why are we predicting salaries to decrease? Yeah, that's what I was asking. So maybe we can just get some additional yeah. information on that. Okay, and can I make sure that I am getting the correct information too, um, so I can bring back the proper answer? We're on page 15. 16. 16. That might have something <coughs> to do with it. Oh. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bill. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm assuming then we'll just flag that for more information. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Rice. Just uh, following up on page 16, the uh, services rises dramatically, like 50 grand. Mm -hmm. That's page 16 of the green box. Um, um, yes, uh, Council Rice, um, we're including cost coverage for software and services that had typically been in the capital budget. And um, I had referenced some increases in regards to um, license fees um, and also programming support costs for existing projects that had not been budgeted for. So, so in part, it's costs from a different area being transferred into this area, in part at least? That's correct, Mayor Given. I also note that under other direct costs, there's three grand a year. I assume that's licensing fees. Yes, I, I believe that is true, but I will confirm that for you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councillor Terrence? Is Mary Given? I know there was some discussion in uh, around downtown incentives. I don't know if that falls in this area or if it's going to be talked about later or if it's something we should flag now, if we get some direction on that. Sure, yeah, I mean, it's probably economic development suited so I'm sure so we'll flag the discussion of uh, downtown development incentives thank you okay okay go ahead change it thank you mayor given um, moving on to economic development and land management um, following along with focused areas um, ensure, ensuring the cost of doing business in our area is competitive and the objective here is to develop a clear understanding of the cost structure for business and also benchmark different industry sectors and note the different cost structures. This will pinpoint the areas that need improvement to achieve the greater competitiveness that we are looking for. Um, we're also looking to capitalize on existing transportation infrastructure, support initiatives to become a better transportation hub for all people, products, and services. Implement a database to reduce manual processes, um, which will speed up the speed, accuracy, and consistency of our service, both internally and externally. We're working on creating an internal and external land education program. Uh, the objective is to educate the internal and external stakeholders to advise them of our roles in the use of public land 
to ensure consistent and justifiable application of our bylaws, policies, and procedures, just to make things clearer for everybody. Ensure an adequate supply of developable land. The objective is to in, in, encourage that and to ensure that there is land available to meet the needs of a variety of industries. And again, Brian's report yesterday reflected an awful lot of that. Quality of life, and enhance what it's like to live here in this city. Uh, support the development of a regional health care system through partnerships and encourage more opportunities to complete higher education locally, such as Grand Prairie Regional College. Uh, core land review. Uh, review the city's current land holdings to ensure that owned land is fulfilling a current or future purpose and is core to the city's operations. Land identified as non-core could be recommended to be deemed marketable and then sold. Policy development and maintenance, reduce unauthorized use of public land and ensure that any policies reflect the current needs of the city and its citizens. Develop a long-term economic development strategic plan uh, to create that long-term vision in conjunction with Council for Economic Development, Growth and a cohesive plan for our community as we move forward into the future. Continue to market the region as an attractive place to live, work, and invest, which ties in very much so with the quality of life. Uh, address our current workforce needs, attract more labor to Grand Prairie, and balance the supply of labor in the region by supporting businesses with their recruitment. Ensure our reach to, with all of our marketing efforts, are more effective and targeted in attracting people and business to relocate here and build and maintain a positive image of Grand Prairie. Councillor Rice in the queue. Mm -hmm. Jane, if, I'm, if I go back under exploring new directions, what you read and what shows on my sheet here on the slide are, are different. So if, if somebody were to want to buy a piece of city land, is this the person, the position they would fold? That would be my understanding. Um, yeah. Councillor Rice, yes, it would be. And moving along, balanced supply of industrial land and ensure we have a seven to 10 year supply of serviceable and shovel ready industrial land. So when companies come here, they are ready to go because we are as well. Mm. Having technical difficulties. Thank you, and uh, the last slide for this particular area, corporate web management. Um, identifying areas where the public needs more information about services and really move towards the self-serve online educational resources for the public. Um, that's the kind of communication lots of folks want. Um, of course, we'll provide the person to person, but as much as we can drive people to our website because it is filled with the information that they need um, is certainly a priority. Increase access to those services and make sure we have a very thorough inventory of the public services offered by the city. Ensure cityofgp.com content is accurate, it's up to date, it's user focused, and organized in a logical manner. Rethink, rebrand, and modernize the Muni portal and encourage our residents to use online services as much as possible. This is a very large theme in this particular area. Um, Insurecityofgp.com remains modern, easy to use, and again, mobile friendly because those are that's the platform people are choosing to use more than anything. Improve staff support for assisting our customers. Um, make the, our websites, regardless of which one it might be, part of everyday customer service. And use customer service data to inform website content development. The analytics that we have available to us are incredible. And um, certainly working very hard with uh, our other departments to ensure that that is used so they can target their own programs more specifically. 
um, continue to promote a very positive view of our city. It's a great place to live and we have lots going on here and so c content on our website, appearance of our website, make sure it is consistently styled, professional and accurate. Optimize our current internal resources. Um, we educate all of our staff on how to do these things. Then issues can be managed um, at the department level. And when people look for answers, we're able to provide them in effective and a very uh, speedy manner. Support initiatives to strengthen the downtown core through our key services. It's about making sure that the public information that we have available is indeed public and that anything about our downtown is available to the community, to our citizens as soon as possible. Work with our corporate communications team to promote a, corp a communications culture within the city. That involves also promoting planning and consistency in our communications. Enhance the link linkages between the city, the community, and the region because there are so many of them. We have so many partners. And improve the number of those referrals from community websites. And continue to strengthen the relationships that we have with all of our neighbors. Create user-focused online experiences for our recreation facilities. Facilitating the transparency of the organization through open data through the web, develop policy resources and educational materials for open data, and identify that data that the public would find of interest and value. And again, create interest for our public to head to the open data and to foster innovation in that regard. And finally, increasing public engagement with the city of Grand Prairie. Um, we've become a very engaged organization. It's very important to uh, the city of Grand Prairie. And if we uh, if when we do these things and are open, transparent, then the public will want to be engaged and are interested in all of the activities, regardless of what they are. And Mayor Gibbon, we move on to environmental stewardship. Key services are providing science-based support regarding environmental issues assisting Aquaterra in their relevant programming, supporting and monitoring all sustainability plans, uh, community engagement activities, and providing assistance on sustainable funding opportunities. A change to the planning in environmental stewardship over the past includes science-based reporting means that science is used to influence any recommendations that are made to council. Um, and the inclusion of the department's ability to assist with grants and funding sources for sustainability projects. There's, there's green money out there and this is the group that would assist you in getting it. Uh, you can see the resources there, the manager, sustainability coordinator, and a, we have two casuals as well. Um, successes for this department, uh, of course, um, driven by council, the community mobility plan was completed along with the corporate greenhouse gas inventory, the transition from the Take Part, Take Pride Committee to the commu Community Enhancement Advisory Committee, and the incorporation of in-house technical expertise into city planning and practices. Of course, environmental impacts are included on all administrative reports. Uh, challenges remain resources, um, and some, the perception somewhat that we have uh, a non-essential department dealing with a very essential service um, and getting um, or buy-in from the community and the organization in terms of what environmental stewardship can, can bring to the organization. And continuing to work on uh, processes and procedures within the department. It's a brand new area. They were uh, forging new ground with this and uh, it's been a bit of a challenge to, uh, to move forward in regards to that. Okay, moving on to the focus areas. Um, optimizing existing services, uh, partners for climate protection program. There are five milestones um, in uh, that program. And so far, corporate inventory and in setting a reduction tar target, which is half of the first and second milestone. Over the next four years, it's anticipated we'll complete the community inventory and set a reduction tar target 
which happens to be the final step of milestone one and two, and developing a local action plan, implementing that action plan, and then monitor monitoring the progress of that plan. Uh, the environmental master plan um, involves a better understanding of ecosystem services and environmental needs within the community and the organization. Um, along with that is the development of an employee sustainability guide and continuing to be involved more with other um, uh, programs, projects, and behaviors. Um, increase the number of our residents under strengthening our core who are using active transportation strategies. Understand external impacts and influences on our environment and also monitor and update the municipal and regional sustainability plans and create city community energy and emissions plan. So staffing request for environmental stewardship is one full-time community mobility coordinator um, to be implemented in 2018 to look after the goals and objectives of the community mobility plan. Um, this is a new position that we'll be working with the community mobility team to develop an implement implementation process and then would be responsible for ensuring education, encouragement, and evaluation portion of the community mobility plan. I see Councillor Rice in the queue. Yes. Uh, so the uh, position, the Thanks, Councilor Rice. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Gibbon. Um, moving on to the environmental stewardship budget. Um, increases in 2015 largely due to um, a, a the sustainability co coordinator's position being uh, reevaluated and moving up to one, uh, up a band. And the position was also increased from seven hours to eight hours a day to, uh, to meet demands of the uh, position. The addition of casual labor, um, 500 hours per year to assist with implementation of programs. And um, I referenced it before, but the city hall car went from the director's budget to this particular budget. And the increase in 2018 um, would be um, the addition of the community mobility coordinator if council so approves um, and also regular staffing and benefit increase over the life of the budget. Councillor Rice again. Flag that page. Program. So what, what is it that you want to flag, Councillor Rice? The program. The staffing of the program. Is so didn't you just... to 270. Okay, so how is that different from the flag that you just did? I did the 218 mobility coordinator isn't due till 218. Okay, okay. So, th so you want to flag the uh, just the general cost of the program? No, no. Okay. Okay, uh, Councillor McLean. Thank you, Mayor Gibbon. I, I see um, changes here, and you're saying we moved the car over, but the car was paid for in the last council for 16000 So you, when you say you move over, it's oil changes and gas. It ain't that much in that car, right? Do we have the thing? I mean, there's been a lot of these changes, but it, you know, it ain't very much for the change. The vehicle's already been paid, and it's gas and oil, and how far it goes. So I, I see a lot of them numbers kind of wondering about. So... so uh inflated a bit I think well I just want to make sure if I have a correct understanding anytime we have a unit there is an interdepartmental charge and that's what's been transferred over uh, and so that would be those fleet charges that we discussed yeah, so whether, charges. whether the car is bought and paid for um, there are funds that are there for the eventual replacement the maintenance the labor costs so it's it's um, I don't know about replacement but uh, I can see maybe some tires and oil changes it's a pretty new vehicle Anyways, there's numbers we're missing, but I'll ask when we come to corporate. Okay, so yeah, so just to clarify, uh, uh, just so that we do have an understanding on that, it's uh, that would be the change from asking. Would that be the change from the interdepartmental line? I'm on page 18 here. Inter interdepartmental line in 2014 was $5,500, and it goes to 84, uh, and then to 11.6. 
Is that essentially the transfer of the fleet charge? Is that the line item that we're discussing? That would be my understanding, Mayor Given, but I can confirm that. And I apologize, I'm just going to skip right over that last one. That slide should not have been there. It should be with the community funding groups. So my apologies for that. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Katashar. Thanks, Mayor Given. Um, for Councillor Logan, um, there's a slide that I just skipped over that was not supposed to be in that location. It shows up in the community funding portion of the presentation later. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Mayor Given, we now move on to geographic information systems. And the vision for this particular department is the delivery of leading geographic information systems technology, products and services that provide value to the corporations, citizens, businesses and institutions. Ubiquitous. <laughs> yes. Um, the mission is to leverage technical data and personnel resources of the city to elevate GIS products and services. Um, and that includes an enterprise approach to all business activities, enhancing our data management technology, uh, integration of geospatial technologies and processes with existing and future business applications, dynamic business needs definition and development to meet the needs of our customers, expand our partnerships and collaborations with both internal and external users, and ongoing investment in human capital and knowledge transfer. Focus areas for GIS, um, regional GIS opportunities um, to develop a sustainable services model to regional organizations that would provide short and long-term benefits to all parties. Um, develop a plan to promote and align GIS technologies and business requirements and provide optimum value to the citizens. Develop the diversity of technical knowledge among the team to enhance opportunities for optimum service delivery. Exploring new directions in terms of open data, annexation of course will create some, some new requirements for us and also mobile workforce. Key services for GIS, um, data and records management, includes all of our corporate records, hard copy maps, digital computer aided drafting files, as built in record drawings of many shapes, sizes, and formats. And just a fun fact for you, 45,208 or 287 corporate scanned profile mapping records are now in our digital library. That is a 210% increase in records since 2011. GIS also provides data analysis and visualization. Um, mapping and graphic services, plotting and large format printing. These are uh, any large scale maps that are required. Um, so far, uh, over 3,000 large scale maps um, have been printed and over 26,000 small maps. Uh, GIS application design and development and support education and customer service both externally Success, uh, successes and challenges. Um, the successes, um, the open source mobile application strategy. Um, GIS apps are now available, um, which is very cool. I was playing with it last week, actually. 100% GIS software application migration. Um, that um, was a big effort, but it, uh, it certainly worked uh, very well for us. Um, service levels uh, to maintain those. Um, the Open Data Initiative, um, and sp spatial database technology, enhanced team and corporate communications, and then digital records management of corporate mapping. Uh, 
um, challenges, of course, in this particular area, as I think we'll find with IT when they make their presentation, technology and how quickly it changes always remains a challenge. Uh, recruiting um, is, um, is also uh, difficult. Um, the GIS migration was a two-year project that took two full-time people uh, in-house to manage, um, but we got it done. And, um, and then, again, in relation to the rapid change of technology, having things keep up um, with, with where we need to be. Let's see, Councillor Rice may have a question. Do you have an enhanced spatial data repository? The province has that spatial data warehouse. Do we take advantage of that or, or use that? Or? Council Rice, it's my understanding that we do, but I would look, like to confirm that for you. Yeah, that's fine, thanks. Mayor Given, moving on to the GIS budget. Thank you. Um, the fairly standard budget with a resource requirement in 2015 of converting a 0.25 uh, position to become full-time or to add to what's already existing. Uh, it's a support technician that is, it is a conversion and it's a current split with ITS. So we would have, there's 0.75 and we're asking for the 0.25 to make it full-time in GIS. And then in 2016, uh, a full-time document management tech technician. This is also a conversion. It has been temporary full-time since 2010. Oh, $1,000 grant are we losing? It's my understanding that's, that $10,000 is reflective of the revenue we don't get because we don't print as many maps. But I can confirm that. We flagged the uh, full-time position in 216. The conversion, Council Radford? Let me see it. You can have that slide back up on screen. It's okay. Okay. It's a conversion. Councilor Redburn is choosing not to flag it, I think, and his uh, conversion from a temporary position to a regular established position. Okay, so we're on to planning and development then. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Given. Um, planning development has um, put the slide right up front for your reference, and we can move back to it as we get into the budget piece. Um, Key services by this particular work unit uh, planning, of course, the uh, processing applications for the land use bylaw, and some information for you: the LUB amendment application in increased from a low of two in 2011 to we're already at 18 in 2014, and it looks like we'll be at 25 by year end. Area structure plan amendments and outline new plan applications have increased as well. And we're looking at going from to 11 ASPs uh, by the end of 2014. In 2015, uh, it's the five-year point to initiate reviews for both the municipal development plan and the intermunicipal development plan. And uh, while the business plan does not presume the province will approve or reject the city's annexation application, 
either outcome will require revisions to the IDP and the MDP and ongoing intermunicipal negotiations and coordination. Planning and development staff have been working since late 2013, identifying needed revisions to the LUB and already have direction from Council and Committee to proceed with several policy-based changes to regulations and standards such as landscaping, parking and secondary suites and those are on our outstanding items list as you know. Planning has also been working with engineering and other departments to complete a comprehensive infrastructure assessment and rehabilitation and urban design plan for the downtown Grand Prairie area and this project will continue into the next budget cycle and a number of potential sub-issues have already emerged for future planning and design. Residents' interest in neighborhood planning and redevelopment and infill has also emerged in the past two years with the possibility of new area redevelopment plan requests and reviews of existing plans. Uh, additional planning work to augment the industrial attraction strategy and support economic development initiatives is re further required in the next four years. Let's see, Councillor Logan. Just a uh, general question that in terms of all of the uh, uh, functions that uh, planning and development handles and the size of the staff right now and the uh, incredibly active uh, community we have in economic terms, what's your opinion of the uh, planning department's ability to handle the demands that are put on it as of right now? Well, it is indeed, it's, it's a challenge, uh, Councillor Logan, and a fourth planner has been added throughout this budget cycle, um, and, you know, it Starting is... It, 2017, right? That's correct. Um, it, is, it is indeed a challenge. Um, we're, as you well know, very, very busy, and with some of the stats that have just been relayed to you, um, it doesn't seem like we're going to get less busy, and if you look at some of the charts that are coming up as part of this presentation, um, you can see that as well. Thank you, uh, Mayor Given. Uh, just in terms of sitting in on uh, the relevant uh, uh, council committee, uh, we've heard several times about the uh, the or asked several. I've heard asked several times for extra work, and and the planning department uh, referencing that that's not possible with the resources they have. Therefore, I'd like to flag this item. So flag the additional planning position in 2017? Yep, move it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Gibbon. Um, planning and development also um, looks after searches and compliances. Um, our growing community, active residential, commercial, and industrial real estate market has driven up demand for municipal land use bylaw compliance certificates required by lending institutions for new properties. In 2013, 1,173 applications were processed, generating revenues of more than $100,000. These are expected to continue or slightly increase over the next four years. New service instituted by Council last year as well is a process for approval of neighborhood entrance features. Planning and development coordinates applications under Council's NEF policy with the Engineering and Facilities Department. Moving on to development permitting unit. Um, this was newly integrated with planning in mid-2013 as part of our organizational uh, restructure. Uh, administration has streamlined a number of processes related to the land use bylaw administration, including recommendations accepted by council to reduce non-essential permit requirements for minor accessory structures and eliminated non-mandated <laughs> services. These uh, changes coincided with introduction of the City View electronic permitting and data management system. Moving on, planning and development permitting staff have been working together since mid-2013 to identify conflicting regulations or inconsistencies in the text of the land use bylaw to come up with solutions and recommendations for committee direction. Um, the strategy of ongoing improvement is premised on ensuring the LUB provisions and lot standards flow from and are consistent with Council's goals and objectives expressed in the Municipal Development Plan and other land use policy documents. 
Well, processing has been simplified to review and issue eligible permits quickly and efficiently. Administration has been equally focused on striving for compliance to ensure consumer safety and minimize conflicts between any incompatible uses. Um, and to that end, the Planning and Development Department has been working together with inspection services and bylaw enforcement teams to address matters of non-compliance when identified. Successes, um, the planning and development merger, um, streamlining uh, the development permitting and compliance processes, city views on, st on stream, um, enhanced research technical and spatial analysis capabilities. Um, uh, significant um, one that stands out, I think, for all of us is the annexation application to the Municipal Governance Board and improved access to and use of the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board appeal process. Challenges, um, maintaining excellent customer service um, with the growing demand and the available resources that we have, um, making sure we have effective organizational communication. Public education and information on land use pr planning process for our infrastructure, fleet, finance, buyer, and other services that the City of Grand Prairie offices, offers, pardon me, and support uh, SDAB learning and draw feedback from decisions for the Municipal Development Plan and Bylaw Review, and once again, recruitment and retention of qualified, experienced staff. So, um, you can see here when we're looking at the number of development applications, I had referenced um, some, of, some of those numbers to you earlier um, and um, noting that uh, 2014 year to date um, is moving along quite nicely um, along with outline plans. Um, the MDP, ARP, and NEFs are, are a little bit lower, but you can see how busy um, that we have been putting together those stats in regards to the number of applications that have been submitted. Uh, development permitting statistics, uh, the number of permits issued in regards to compliance, signs, major minor development, and municipal approvals. Um, again, busy spot. Um, in reference to I'll back that up just a little bit again as well. The city no longer releases real property reports from address files to the public for a compliance, um, which is resulting more likely for people using title insurance. Um, the process for portable sign permits has changed, resulting in a decline in those permits being issued. And as of September 2013, uh, development permits were no longer required for most decks and sheds in the 215 square feet. So that would have resulted um, in a decline in minor development permits being issued. And revenue projections by type, you can see the development permits. Um, sure, Jane, I'm just ask you to make sure that you're just speaking loudly so we can. Oh, sorry. It's getting quiet for me. Okay. Um, revenue projections by type, you can see in the thousands of dollars. Um, we have been looking for are what we will be looking for in the next budget cycle. Um, development permits, of course, uh, leading the way. See Councillor O'Toole with a question. Yes, if you could, thanks Jane, and thanks Mayor Given. Uh, could you give me a little bit more information on the real property report and the insurance uh, uh, claim that you could possibly make? So just just to clarify, just uh, Council Tool, you're looking for some information on on the system. Yeah. Uh, does it relate to the budget, or will it have? Well, it will. I was just wondering if we could flag that then. What the uh, what the losses are, and uh, compared to customer satisfaction. Okay. okay. So so the item that you're flagging is the discontinuation of. Uh, Real property report. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Tarrant. Mary Gibbon. Just a question uh, in regards to the uh, hospital. Is that going to have much of an impact on uh, revenues for the planning development? That will, but my understanding that is not 
in this budget area. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Mayor. Given the uh, f fees for the planning development part regarding the hospital have already been paid. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, Mayor. Given moving on to the planning and development budget. Um, Differences between 2014 and 15, um, the increased revenue offset expenditures, um, an increase between 2015 and 16, uh, additional salary, ex salary expenses to the city for the planning intern, because the second year installment of municipal intern government grant funds uh, goes from $43,900 down to $24,000 in uh, 2015 in the second year and also the GIS software for the planning technicians so we have two municipal interns um, one that administrative that reports to community growth um, director and as well we have a planning um, technician and that is a two-year program the other one is a one-year program um, the difference between 2016 and 17 um, Expenses increased uh, due to the hiring of a fourth planner if council so chooses and other employee wage step increases and then in the final year the difference um, is expenses increased due to anticipated replacement of a large plotter at a cost of $10,000 and revenue decreased because the second year installment of the municipal intern government grant fund again goes from 43900 to down to $24,000 Expenses increased to cover municipal intern wages and expenses not covered by the grant portion. Um, can I, so, um, I'm not exactly sure how to ask this. Um, in the uh, development officer area, um, we don't see anything coming forward in this budget cycle. Um, and I felt that this was one of the priority areas that uh, council had sort of identified in terms of supporting development of the community and, and uh, business processes, uh, interaction with customers, I guess, essentially. And so I'm wondering, is there, wondering about the capacity in this department um, and if we have uh, the right amount of staffing to meet the demand. Um, so I wonder if I could flag for some additional information um, the uh, capacity of the development services uh, department related to that demand. So I'd like to have some more information to meet you know, on, on that. Okay, thank you, Mayor Gibbon. Thank you. Um, planning and development focus areas. Explore opportunities to partner in municipal service delivery, contribute to the vision and plan for downtown, provide policy and technical support, community mobility, and provide policy advice and regulatory options for residential goals to both the community and council. I see Councillor Logan. It's just a quick question on the uh, strengthening our core. Is what you're uh, referencing there uh, new work that you're expecting the department to do in, or is it just building on existing? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last part, Councillor Logan. The three items under strengthening our core, is that expected to be new work, new areas uh, for the department to be contributing in, um, or is it a continuing existing? It's continuing existing, Councillor Logan. So why, uh, I, I don't mean to be petty about this, but why are we talking about strengthening? It does not, not denote uh, additional resources needed? It's my understanding that this is um, planning and development has been involved with uh, downtown work um, for quite some time and um, understanding council's um, desire to see or, or council's focus on our downtown area um, and I know that they have been involved whether it's talking about um, parking, um, developing appropriate, you know, 
provisions in regards to that. Um, just involved in all kinds of planning in the downtown area. And that's, it's not new. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not. Okay. Thanks, Councilor Logan. And the last slide for planning development, um, offering policy advice to balance, re balance residential and non-residential development, provide research-based strategic policy options for residential infill, and finally, capitalizing on growth, ensure that the land use planning represented in scope of broader service planning and contribute to increase the length and depth of full range of planning documents. And that's in, in as a direct result of what our citizens and businesses require. Thank you, Mayor Bell. Uh, Jane, I'm just uh, curious, uh, on page 25 of our green binder under planning and development, there's uh, capital costs. Uh, it looks like it's 5,000 right across the board, but in 2015 it jumps up to 22. I was just wondering what that cost is associated with. Can you reference that line again, please, Councillor Thiessen? Uh, capital, uh, 2015. Uh, the whole lines from 14 to 18 are $5,000, and then there's $22,000 uh, charge on 2015 on page 25. All right, I'll get that information for you. Thank you. Is that Jane, you previously referenced a plotter? A pl $10,000 $10, for the plotter. And then in that year? Uh, in, that's 2017. 2017. So I, I can find out from that through to that. Thank you. Thank you. The question is on the 2015, the change in the 20, between 2015 and 2014 for the plotter. So. And um, the last part of the community growth presentation is re in regards to Revolution Place. And focus areas are building more partnerships with our promoters, our major sports tenant, event organizers, local businesses, our suppliers, not-for-profit groups, recognizing ex existing and new Revolution Place partnerships are mutually beneficial opportunities. And we certainly have um, developed a great opportunity this year with our naming rights partner, which happens to be one of our, our uh, strongest partnerships um, that we have going currently. Strengthening our core, um, we're hope springs eternal. There are still things that we can do um, in regards to expanding services, um, making some minor structural changes to the venue to better meet the needs of our uh, of our clients and the general public. Um, and um, we've already put our heads together on what that potentially could look like. Capitalizing on growth, a, gr a growing number of superior event services um, to provide a wide variety of events to that appeal to every demographic that we have in the city and the region. And I'll just remind you right now what we currently have on sale, um, which I think speaks to that. Um, broad Appeal, um, Mike the Night, which is children's programming, Celtic Tenors, um, which is a very, very different kind of group for us to host. And we have Monster Trucks in April, and uh, Volbeat, Anthrax, and Crowbot. And I know you all know who those people are. So it, it certainly cuts, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it certainly cuts and then you throw on top of that, you know, our Grand Prairie Storm, our, our major sports tenant, um, the banquets, the galas, the trade shows. Um, the intent is to continue to broaden that spectrum so people are staying here for their entertainment and sport options. Let's see, Councillor Rice. We have lost or cancelled the contract with the, I'll say Ticketmaster, but it wasn't Ticketmaster. So have we seen any uh, 
Has there been any outfall from that? Um, back in May of 2013, Councillor Rice, Ticketmaster, decided to pull the services that it provided um, at Revolution Place along with a couple of other outlets. Um, yes, there has been uh, some fallout. Despite the fact that happened in May 2013, we still get requests virtually every day. We're tracking that information and we have been in conversation with Ticketmaster to get them to return the service to us. The citizens certainly recognized it as a service that is of value to them and lots of people like walking out of the venue with their tickets in their hands whether they're going to an event in Vancouver, Edmonton, Montreal, Toronto. So we are working to get it back. So did they cancel because we were hard to work with, because we didn't do enough volume, because they couldn't make enough money? Like, there's a myriad of reasons. Which one? Um, well, there were, from their perspective, the, de the decision was made out of the states, and they felt that the outlets, and it just wasn't the outlet in Grand Prairie, were not producing what they wanted. Um, there is a, a new uh, CEO of Ticketmaster in Toronto who does not share that vision and is very, we speak with her monthly and we, uh, we send her our stats monthly and they, they know, she knows that uh, it's a service that is required here and she's very interested in bringing it back. Uh, we don't have any signed documentation at this point in time, though. Okay, so you're just not a big enough market for it. It was a lot of it had to do with volumes. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the highlights. Um, I'll move on to the next one. Uh, thank you, Mary Given. Uh, success is this year at uh, the Revolution. Before you do, there's a sorry, councillor in the queue. Um, thank you, Mary. I think it would be more for, I don't know, just information here, but maybe come back to uh, Community Growth Committee, um, strengthening our core and capitalizing our growth, even though we're not doing expansion. We could be doing things differently in operation, and one that could be opening up with local promoters and actually make more events come to the building. So I'd like this to be brought back to Community Growth uh, to look at, just because we're not getting expansion, we may be able to look at a different planning with the Revolution Place. I think it's an overhaul needed. So that's a referral item. Yeah. Um, so I guess um, revised operating plans or uh, based on yeah how we're going to make it work even better, more efficient since we're not about expansion but more growth of different concerts coming in for promoters because it's easier build and more stronger partners with promoters and agents and the event industry in junior hockey. We know the junior hockey's been done pretty good. But I think we can do better on promoters and agents. So I just I'll leave it like that. Let it come to community growth. So the more words aren't actually helpful in determining what it is specifically yeah. that you want to have referred. So just if you can give me a line of because somebody somebody out there has got to write this down yeah. and make sure it gets on the agenda the way that you want it. So what's the specific? Yeah, option? operating strategies oh, for sorry. options and for bringing more income yeah, to local community. Way. Start to add. More yeah, operating strategies. More confusing. <laughs> options. Just keep it simple. Yeah. So, so, so I'll do it that. Okay. Revolution Place operating strategies. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a referral. Okay. Councillor Rice. Backing on that, and I know somebody has to write this down, so let me ramble and then I'll edit. But, um, you know, it's long been a frustration of mine. Food concession contracts. Um, options concession contract options. If if I go to the Sandman and book a banquet, they throw in the room. If I book a banquet at Revolution Place, I got to pay for the food plus I got to pay for the room. And that makes it non-competitive. So I'd like to look at what options we can do. Okay. Okay. Food concession options for committee. That's referral. Yes. Thanks very much. Go ahead, Jane. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mayor Given. Um, still on successes and uh, challenges. Um, the naming rights deal uh, with the Revolution Auto Group and 
one of the major uh, components of that is that this particular group, I'll remind Council, uh, has indicated that they will go two shows annually and they are totally financially responsible for those. Any, any profit left over from those particular events will be given back to the city, to the venue, um, and to be used for determined purposes prior to. Um, and that, I can tell you, is unheard of. Expansion plans are, uh, we still believe that is a success. It's a good plan and it will be a, a good reference for councils moving forward. Uh, a new three year contract with our Grand Prairie Storm. Um, and, and I think the hallmark of that particular agreement is the city's desire to work with the team as they write their financial ship. We're in it together, they succeed, the city succeeds. Um, the number of event days that um, take place in the venue are on the rise. Challenges are local and regional competition, um, maintaining competitive ticket prices and event costs, and that's all associated with limited, limited seating capacity along with outrageous artist guarantees. Um, can't just blame it on that. Um, and we have physical, some physical limitations of the event load and area uh, for both the Revolution Arena and the Bose Family Gardens, and we're also limited in our flat floor space too in terms of So um, just wanted to give you an idea of what our event days are looking like. And this information was put together for you on uh, October 29th. So I can tell you that um, as of today, we are at um, 4 2014 180 event days. And an event day is um, any day that the, the venue is booked. So if a client has a three-day show, but they need a front-end day to set up and a back-end day, those are five event days. That's days that the building is booked. So we're, we're crawling back up there. It's a good thing. It also does not include um, our mi in minor or industrial hockey bookings, um, but it does include everything else, storm, concerts, banquets, galas, family shows. Um, I think one of the most exciting things to see that we're definitely on our way back to gain our share of the market is um, as of October 29th, we had 112 confirmed days for 2015. 105 additional days on hold, and we know that more of those, more than 50 of those are confirmed. We just can't make them public yet. So at that time, we had 162 days booked um, for 2015 already, and we have some pretty exciting things in the wings that will blow those numbers out of the water. So like I said, it's positive, and things are on their way. So key services that are provided um, by Revolution Place, um, we're a regional event entertainment and sports venue, and we provide year-round rental space to anyone who wants to rent from us or, or partner with us. So not-for-profit commercial enterprises, local, national, international. Um, Revolution Arena and Bose Family Gardens, well, we have a lot of similarity in terms of the things that we can do with the exception of the ice. Um, and we have clients now who are utilizing both sides of the upcoming uh, Grand Prairie Farmers Market Christmas Craft Show and Sale has used both um, well, the entire venue, the arena, the gardens, and a chunk of the lobby. Um, the Grand Prairie Women's Show, for the first time this year, we used both sides of the venue. Um, and she's been with us, uh, that client has been with us for 20 years. And uh, the services that are provided by staff, uh, box office, in-house and external, and you saw from that box office report that was that it is uh, a nice enterprise uh, piece of our business and uh, we are well utilized both internally and externally. Special event management, production, marketing, sales and promotions, guest services, operations and catering. So moving to the staffing and you will likely see on yours that for 2014 it said 12, that should have been 12.5 so I did make the correction on the slide because um, it didn't match what was uh, in the book. Um, we are asking for, um, in 2015, a conversion to a full-time position for an operations worker, and that temporary position has been in place for just over eight years. 
and then in 2016 we're asking for a 0.5 permanent position. Um, we currently have a guest services supervisor who is 0.5 part-time permanent and 0.5 temporary and we'd like to make that full-time permanent and that position has been in place So both of them are confirmed. See Councillor Radford. Thank you, Mayor So, um, question is for Jane and and, uh, and Greg. Actually, um, it's uh, my understanding that we've had a program audit uh, at Revolution Place. So I'm wondering when that uh, report will come to committee. Councillor Radburn, that report will be coming to committee next month. Okay. Are there staffing implications in that report? Um, no. Um, there might have been um, some suggestion because we are, well, not might have been, there was some suggestion because we have such cramped quarters that perhaps one person could uh, relocate to City Hall um, to conduct um, the business of the venue. Councillor Thiessen. I guess I'd just uh, like to flag those positions for more discussion. Okay. So the conversion positions? You betcha. Okay. Um, I also had a question as well, if I may. Um, Jane, uh, I'm looking at page 27 on the salaries line. <clears throat> it seems to fluctuate quite a bit. It kind of looks like a heart monitor chart, chart. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Throughout the years, I'm just uh, wondering why that is. Okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor Thiessen. Um, as we've moved to a, and I hope I can explain this appropriately, as we've moved to a new budgeting system, um, previously we had a chunk of money for casual staff, and we require casual staff for guest services, for ticketing, sometimes for operations. So there were no names associated with that. Um, were actual numbers of hours. It was a bit of a, okay, well, we'll hope that this works, and it primarily had. The new system means we have to identify everyone, and then it is, um, you know, we look at the previous few years, what's going to be reasonable in terms of uh, expectations for the years going forward and how many guest services staff we might require. We know for sure we have 29 hockey games that we need 15 to 17 people at. Um, you know, we have concerts that we're going to have or other events so we look at what we have and it that is on the books and confirmed and then we have to add a bump to that to cover off anything that um, will be over and above that but we also have the opportunity and I hope this doesn't muddy the waters that for events like mm -hmm. concerts we charge for the guest services and then we put that back into a revenue um, into a revenue stream too so it offsets its sum um, but not all. So 2015 is our first major year of getting all of those casuals sorted out and identified. And then it was based on this is what we believe we're going to have with trying to look into a crystal ball for events um, and, and to see what kind of casual staff that, that we might need in the future. So um, it's an educated guesstimate. That's probably the best way to put it. If possible, would I be able to, to flag this item? Maybe we can find some, a more round number rather than deal with increases and decreases year after year. It might be wise or not, or just to have that discussion. Or maybe you can round it down. Who knows? <laughs> See how the conversation goes. So you want to flag the uh, salaries line item? Yeah, all, all straight through right till 2018. else um, um, I, I think uh, mayor given just uh, part of uh, council Radburn had referenced the review that we had done and one of the major statements that we had coming out of that is that revolution place would be the instinctive go-to choice for clients and patrons alike uh, the, 
Upgraded and expanded facility is not only attractive, welcoming, and friendly, it is a cool place to do business. We successfully host all types of events and staff, whether managing events, providing support services, or answering inquiries, continues to provide excellent service to one and all. Asking everybody to join the revolution. Okay, thanks very much. And so I think that's the last of your departments in the service area. It's probably an appropriate time to take a break. So we will break now. It's uh, we'll call it 10:40, although that's not quite. And we'll be back at uh, uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes. So at 10:2, uh, 10, 10 to 11.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, we've had our little break, and we're ready to go with corporate services. And Mr. Anderson is at the uh, presenter's table. Ken? Thank you. We've uh, created the summary similar to what Jane has done. So what we have in corporate services is financial services, facilities, legislative services, information technology, purchasing, assessment and taxation, and fleet. And those amounts will be included in every presentation. The first one is finance. There's the group. Uh, key services for this group are the manage the investment portfolio, which brings in about $2 million a year in interest revenue. We're also responsible for the reporting to council and to the municipal affairs. We also are responsible for internal controls throughout the organization and with what's been happening recently with Eastlink, we certainly will be getting out into the field more to review those primary accounting functions. We're also responsible for the financial systems and the supporting systems that go along with it. For example, timekeeping, work management, those sorts of things. We also provide the training and the support for those financial systems. Plus, they do quite a bit of consulting with various departments on initiatives that may, they may have. They also work on the long-range financial planning and policy making. It's finance that leads the business planning process. They're also responsible for many of the policies that Council has regarding financial, financial issues. <clears throat> The staff changes. There are no additional staff planned for this department. We are going through a reorganization at the moment. We've, so what their plan is to do for the finances, you can see in 15, the actual budget amount actually goes down. They have a vacant position, which they're going to hold open for a while until they see where the work falls out, and then they'll fill it at that point. So there is no new staff in this department at all. We get to the general revenue sections. What we have is taxes for general purposes. We've assumed two and a half million dollars growth per year. And I can give you some uh, historical numbers here. In, in 2008, it was $4.2 million. 2009, it was $3.1 million. 2010, it was $2.2 million. 2011, it was $1.1 million. 2012, it was $1.6 million. 2013, it was $2.7 million. And 2014, it's $3.1 million. So we've assumed $2.5 million worth of growth for each year. <clears throat> as far as some of the other revenue that we have, we have an Aquaterra dividend portion of it is mandatory, about $1.6 million. There's also a discretionary portion of it around $1 million. And if we've talked with Aquaterra and their CFO over there, and for the $1 million discretionary dividend, we're going with a 4% increase in 2015. We're going to hold it constant for 16, an increase of 20% in 17, and a further 5% in 2018. In addition, as you know, we're making a $4 million contribution for the trunk line that's going to be uh, led by Aquaterra. What happens there, two years after we make that cash contribution, we do get more dividends. It becomes a mandatory dividend. So in 2017, we're expecting another $200,000 on the mandatory dividend. So that would go from $1.6 to $1.8 million. Councillor Rice, I see you had a question. <clears throat> I'm looking under other revenue. I know, like, for example, you you have revenue of $30,000 from doing the downtown uh, processing, but I don't see that showing up. Well, we haven't shown all the dividends. We've, or, I mean, all the revenue. We've shown some of the major categories, but yes, you're quite correct. Well, there is lots of other revenue. Yes. 
Sorry, Councillor Rice, do you mean many other sources of other revenue? Yes. Okay, because in terms of lots, is probably... <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Anderson? Uh, some of the other dividends that we have, we have an airport dividend of 90, 96500 That's been consistent for many years. It hasn't changed at all. We also get franchise fees from Atco Gas, Atco Electric, and Aquaterra. Those estimates come from those organizations, as well as we get revenue sharing agreement with the county and Sexsmith, and that's related to the Aquaterra, uh, the creation of that entity. Facility maintenance, their key services are preventative and reactive maintenance for all city-owned facilities. They have 40 buildings to maintain, which vary from mice arenas to, to aquatic centers to all sorts of things. They have over 100 play lots, these neighborhood playgrounds that you find. They're maintained by facility staff. As well as all the public utility lots, or the PULs. Other services that they provide, they provide weekly inspections, preventative maintenance, life cycle planning, project management, renovations, new construction projects. They're also on call 24 hours a day, and they're there for capital improvement consultation. Their staffing currently is sitting at 21.5 full-time and four temporary staff. 2015 to 18, their request is to go from 21.5 to 23.5 and to reduce the number of temps that they have. And I'll get into those full-time positions in a minute. The summer temp positions are related to the public utility lot repairs. Uh, they, determined, they were contracting out some of the services in the past and they'd like to catch up on those with temporary staff. And those are summer staff. I see Councillor Rice. I don't use Brinks for coin <coughs> to take coins to the bank. I, I realize that enforcement services would probably have a lot of coins, but does City Hall have that many coins? We need brinks. Well, <laughs> previously all the coinage would come over here and then be sorted and rolled, and uh -huh. then brinks would come here. It's now being sorted over there. It comes over here, and it's put in the vault until there's a fair amount of it, and then brinks will come and then take it to the bank. So it's it's quite heavy, and it's accumulated over here in the vault. Okay. There are two staffing requests on the full-time side of the project manager in 2015. And this person would oversee the planning, implementation, and tracking of short to medium-term projects. We have numerous smaller projects going on in facilities, and it's very time-consuming. We need somebody to, to actually manage them so that the uh, journeyman staff can actually do some of the work. They also work on determining the resources and schedules required for the project completion. They'll review the project schedules with other city staff and contractors. And they'll monitor the project progress and expenditures and review the quality of the work completed. What we plan to do, there aren't any huge facility construction projects in this cycle. But if there was, for example, the construction of another facility, what we would look at doing is actually engaging a project manager as a cost of that project to have it managed properly. In the past, sometimes we've used people who had capacity, but not necessarily all the skills required. See, Councillor Rice. Ken, you said this person <clears throat> would, this new person would look at a couple of big events coming up. I know in the 100th anniversary, Carol Rayburn played a huge big role. Uh, so would that move it from like her area back over to yours? Because I know Susan was a godsend in terms of, of that, and, and but they required a lot of coordination from her. This person would be more responsible for actual construction projects. Uh, those types of projects would be administered over at City Hall by the appropriate staff. So it wouldn't be a responsibility of this person. So for example, if they have to start doing some major renovations within a facility, it would be the role of this person to oversee and manage that project? Right now, facilities does that, do they not? We're talking about facilities, Council Rice. We've moved on to the facilities. 
talking about a facilities position. Yeah, we're in facilities maintenance at the moment. Okay, so that but that wouldn't be a finance person. No, they would be responsible for the budget in the in the project, but they're that's part of being a project manager. So, so just to clarify, we've moved on from. Yeah, I know. Finance, like finance to facilities. But I guess I'm wondering about the coordination of the, the roles. Facilities and finance. Like it seems to me they have to be intertwined. That's probably why we have them both reporting to Ken. Yeah. Mr. Anderson? Well, they're two distinct areas. I mean, the, the, the position I'm talking about here is related to the construction projects, the significant upgrade projects that happen in facilities, facility renewal projects. Those are the kinds of pro construction type projects that would be managed by this person. And what Councillor Rice is talking about, yes, there is some linkage there, and it would some of it would relate to finance and some of it would relate to staff and other areas like community living, for example. Okay. So yes, that's why I just wanted to ensure the linkages were there. Councillor Radford. Thank you, Mayor Gavin. So, Ken, um, I get the project manager role. <clears throat> you also mentioned construction manager hiring when we have bigger projects. So, like, let's let's look at uh, leisure center. Would the project manager be the construction manager, or would we also have a construction manager? Well, there's many smaller types of projects that occur. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to have a large project like the construction of a multiplex or that type of project, it becomes a full-time job to project manage that and to ask them to project manage that but to do also the smaller jobs, uh, we found that you can result in some issues. And if you want to maximize the quality and minimize the quantity of funding for these projects, you need to have somebody on top of it. But we don't have any significant construction projects coming up in this cycle. so. If they were to arise, it would become a cost of that project. Right. So, so just again, just to build on that, I mean, to be really to the point, so rather than speaking in hypotheticals, because we aren't building another multiplex, but we are envisioning $11 million in a renovation of a facility. So specifically on the leisure center, uh, is that something that would be this person's responsibility? Or would we envision in the leisure center renovation project having a project manager, construction manager on that specific <laughs> That is the type of project that would be led by the project manager? That would be this position. Correct. Yeah. It's an existing facility with a significant renovation project yeah. and uh, a refit. It, it, that's the type of project here as opposed to new construction of a new facility. Okay. Thank you. So it's not so much about dollar value. It's about new construction versus renovation. It really comes down to the complexity of the project and we don't see that complex enough that we would add another person on top of this. Okay. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Mayor Bill. Um, Ken, <clears throat> I'm just going back to the, the new project manager for 2015. I noticed that there's a, a $20,000 decrease from 2014 to 15. Have, is that including the new position that, uh, that we're looking for in facilities or? Which schedule are you looking at? Uh, sorry, page 31 under facilities, uh, salaries for 2015. Well, the facility, that page references all the facilities we maintain. It's the summary of everything. So it's it's actually going up three hundred and forty nine thousand dollars in fifteen. So what that includes is every building that we maintain in facilities department. But it would be part of that cost would reflect the addition of this position. Yes. Okay. So we'd be decreasing despite adding another position. Well, we're increasing the overall budget because of this one position. But there's increases throughout in various other buildings as well. Not sure. Is that your question? Well, no, I was just curious as to why, uh, like if we're adding a new position, why the salaries line is decreasing. And that's that was my question. Oh. I'm 
not sure I'd have to get back to you on that one. Okay. Well, uh, could I, I'd like to just flag that for more info. Okay. Which one would you like more info on? Just one line? Yeah, just that, just that one line. Like, uh, I see, I see that, yeah, it's a $22,000 decrease, but, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering why your salary line would drop if we're adding a new position, so. Well, actually, I think I can answer your question. Oh, okay. What we're doing is, you'll also notice the multiplex in here. You see a decrease in it. What we're doing is we're actually transferring the, and creating a small facility type staff over at the CKC that they would manage those facilities, as well as the leisure center when it's, once it comes up again. So what we've done is we've done a transfer over to Eastlink for those those functions, which thereby decreases the overall facilities salary budget. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. Okay, so I'm going to need to flag that one for further info. We got it there. <laughs> Councillor Rice. I'm trying to get a handle on <clears throat> this position. So if I use instead of theoretically South Bear Creek, that was under the Parks Department. So would would the project management for that stay under Parks? Would it move to this position? Uh, go to sport and recreation I'm not sure that would be a combination really if you look at the building down there that would be a facilities piece it comes down to the maintenance of the fields that would become a parks piece <laughs> so it'd be a combination of parks and rec sport for the outside stuff and the, the building itself that would be a facilities okay thank you <laughs> the second uh, position that they're requesting is a building automating automation technologist so this person would provide routine field technical support as required for the building automation systems. Uh, they'll, they'll be key in the building automation systems that we have and they'll, we're also looking for them to manage the programmable logic controllers and the other equipment and the calibration of that. So that results in better use of energy that's one of the benefits that's going to come out of it. The operating budget overall, you'll see what you have is really two components in here. You have a renewal budget, and that budget actually comes from the facilities renewal reserve. And that's for projects to enhance the building, to lengthen the life of the building, those sorts of projects. Then we have the operating side, and the, the operating side includes all the buildings within the city that they maintain. So what you see here is a combination of, they've recalibrated their numbers throughout for all the buildings based on historical and based on what they know. And each one has a budget related to it. I see Councillor Rice. What would be a, what would a seasonal outdoor facility workers, you're proposing an increase of two for 2015, what would, what would they be? Those two people, they're responsible for the public utilities a lot. That, that's the main focus that they intend to, but they also do playgrounds. Oh, okay. Because so, facilities so mean... Summer people. Correct. Okay. And, and that doesn't fall under parks? No, the playgrounds are done by facilities department, and the PULs, as far as the barriers, those are done by facilities as well. When you look at the cost, the assets that we have in the city are $368 million. The total maintenance budget is $5.2 million, so which is a 1.4. And the manager tells me the industry standards are 2 to 5%. So we get to legislative services. Your responsibilities, uh, I'm sure you know most of this, includes contracts, bylaws, policy management, assessment review boards, subdivision, election, census, petitions, insurance, committee meetings, council meetings, uh, legal advice, and document management. A few statistics for you on appeals. You can see on the left there, the assessment review board. There's those uh, numbers for 14 are from January to September. And on the right-hand side are the subdivision appeal boards. They're higher in 2014, year to date. Bylaws, policies, amendments, you can see some statistics on those as well. And committee and council meetings. 
Let me see the year to date there, and I'm sure most of you know, because you know, most of you are there. <laughs> Here are the insurance claims, and you can see uh, you can see quite a kick up there in 2014. And as you recall, we had extreme weather conditions earlier in the year, which can result in a number of claims. There are no additional staff planned for this department. Currently has five staff in the department. It has three budgets related to it. First one is legislative services. And you'll see an increase in here for 15. And what we've done is there's been um, some movement of some of the membership fees from council budget over to legislative services budget. For example, the AUMA fee is now moved from council over to legislative and that's $27,000. The FCM, FCM fee is moved over here, Chamber of Commerce fee, the gallery fee, those have moved over here. So that pretty much accounts for the major part of your um, increase for 15. And the, the other three years are fairly minimal increases. Here's your budget, council budget. Uh, there's fairly modest increases year to year. We've budgeted 3% salary increases per year. However, that's determined by the cost of living adjustments. In common services, we've made some changes here. What we've done is we used to have postage charge, cross charge to each department. Rather than going through that, well, we've moved all postage straight to the common services budget, as well as all photocopy services in City Hall are now part of the common services budget just to reduce, I mean, there was no value in doing that. See, Councillor Rice has a question or comment. Leg, the legislative services budget. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if it shouldn't be split in another category added, um, which would be regional representation or something. How do you mean, Councillor Rice? Uh, suppose Councillor McLean goes to, I don't know, who represents us at the water thing? Uh, okay, so let's say Rory goes to represent us at the water thing. That shouldn't come out of his allocation, in my opinion. There should be a separate account that that type of thing comes it from. It does. It does? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I didn't if, think if Rory it. decides to take five days of per diems to attend a one day meeting, then that would be discretionary and that would come out of his account. Yeah. I know it took me a day to travel there, a day to travel back, and well, I got snowed in and so I, whatever, that's discretionary. Um, but the cost to attend the meeting um, and the per diems associated with that specific one uh, would be, uh, would not be a part of his just funds. So there's, there's a difference between discretionary and required. And so if it's a required attendance that's all have a required budget? Yep. Where does that show? It would be a part of the council budget, I believe. Okay. Councillor O'Toole? Yes, thank you very much, Mayor Given. I wonder if this would be the appropriate time to uh, review some of the organizations uh, and things that the city actually pays m money into to belong. Would that be, like, uh, that be the time now? Like it? Memberships, yes. Okay. So what, what information would you like? Well, I'm just wondering if maybe we should uh, decline in some of these ones that we haven't really found a successful, uh, we didn't feel or we don't feel possibly okay. that it, we're doing any justice by belonging to them. Okay. So uh, Mr. Anderson, do you have information at hand on what memberships uh, are included or funded through these areas? No, Mayor Given, I don't have that at hand. Okay, so we'll, so we'll get that information. Okay, so I've got a few in the queue here. Um, Councillor Radburn, do you have something specific on this point? I see there's others that were. Well, there. So, Councillor Radburn, um, nobody else heard that because you didn't turn on your mic. The suggest your suggestion was is that a referral to committee uh, there may be a budget impact if there were some things the council chose I mean for example he chose not to 
uh, have a membership in AUMA, um, you know, that would have a budget impact. Maybe some other impacts too, but <laughs> have a budget impact currently. So maybe uh, administration can put together for information uh, a list of the memberships um, the city currently maintains. I know that exists. I'm not sure that's all in this council area. Some may be through economic development or other areas. Um, but I know that, that list exists, and maybe we could just present that for information. Is that what you're looking for, Councillor Joe? Yeah. Would you like that today or some other time? when you guys are able to collect the information for information. Yeah. Um, sorry, as a part of the budget discussions, yes. Sorry, that, that's the question you're asking. Do we want it like weeks from now? No, I think we want it as part of the budget discussions. We want it today. Okay. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Thanks, Mayor Bill. Um, Ken, I, I don't want to get too, too far ahead. Uh, I just had a question going back to uh, accounting services in financial services. Um, you know, you had mentioned earlier that there was a position that uh, wasn't being held, hence the decrease. Um, I was just wondering, like, uh, with, it seems like from 2016, 17, 18, we're putting money in there. Is there an intention to hire or only if we need to, and then we're just budgeting the surplus? Want to give us a page number, Council Thiessen? Sure. Page 29. <clears throat> As far as the salary side goes, there are step increases that are built in there. There's no intention to hire anyone within this department over the four years. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Logan. Well, I recognize that you've already moved on from this, but I did want to speak to that item of uh, uh, looking at uh, memberships and what, what have you to uh, uh, other organizations. Uh, I would be quite opposed to doing that as part of a budget cycle. I think, first of all, it's a matter that needs to be examined on its own merits as to whether there's a value in, or what are the values, and whether the upsides and downsides in dealing with these, uh, being a part of these other organizations. And some of those are fairly complex and should not be the matter of uh, item number seven on a, on a, an agenda. I would say that we should dedicate an initiative in the new year, rather, to examine the range of those things. And then, in a subsequent year, when we're doing a budget uh, review, then we can look at making adjustments. But this is a, too important to crash through on. Thanks, Councillor Logan. So what I'm suggesting is administration could get us the list of what's reflected in this budget, and Council can have a look at that and see if they want to do anything about it. And if they do, I think you're right, there would be something that we would refer for further discussion um, amongst the different organizations. Um, so I'm seeing that as an information request. Um, it may lead to something in budget or may not. Um, but you know, be willing to bet that that, uh, that after the information request, we'll, we'll, it'll be clear which direction we need to move, whether it needs further review or whether it needs no review at all, because we're happy with what's there. Councilor McLean. Um, thank you, Mayor. Again, just question to Ken: When uh, increases our wage, um, and when it's indexed every year automatically. You said 3%? I thought it was lower. Um, <clears throat> what is that index? I just need more information on that because I'd like to red flag that to vote uh, if we're higher than that on property taxes or whatever. I, I'm going to try something here, and uh, so I want to red flag your salaries and get information on that. Well, as far as salaries go, we do have an agreement with QP to the end of next year, so we, we know what those increases are. Well, so not QP for council. Councillor McLean talking about the council salaries? Yeah. And so you referenced that uh, admin had budgeted approximately 3% per year, uh, but you referenced that it's actually tied to something else. Tied to the Alberta cost of living adjustment. So how's that, how's that handled annually, Mr. Anderson? It's uh, beginning of the year. I believe it's looked at what the prior year's adjustment was, the cost of living adjustment was, and council adjust, and then the salaries adjusted accordingly. And then what usually happens near the end of the cycle is that council will ask staff to go away and do an assessment and look at other organizations, other municipalities, and come back with some factors, and then that council would set the pay rate for the following council. I want to red flag that. Uh, I, I might, after we're all done, depending on what we rate, and might do a motion on it, see how it goes. So, so I, I, I think if we're over in that in tax increases, that we should be looking at that we shouldn't be receiving it. So i like to red flag that. So you're red flagging council salaries? Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, 
Councillor Rice. Just going back to the list uh, that he will be preparing, I, I think it, if it could include not only those that memberships we pay, but those who've requested, I think of PASA, the Community Enhancement Advisory Committee, Wapiter Corridor, Corridor Planning Society have requested our membership and they're unfunded at this point, but it could in fact uh, impact the budget because they're, they're between ten and $20,000 asks. And those are reflected in the community group asks, which will be discussed anyhow. Are they? Yeah. Okay. Council Tarrant. Thank you, Mary Gavin. Just wondering, uh, Ken, would you be able to talk about the census and uh, say where the numbers are included in the budget? Well, what we do is we include an amount every year, and it's accrued, and what it does cover is the cost of the census as well as the cost of the election so that it doesn't go in and out continually. So there's a constant amount put in there. Councillor O'Toole. Yes, thanks very much, Mayor Given. Uh, going back to what Councillor uh, Logan had suggested, uh, I just wanted to know what the memberships were that we participate in. And uh, I do agree that uh, at a later community uh, or committee meeting, uh, we discuss that into detail. And I just wanted you to make sure that you knew that as well. Okay. Councillor Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Mayor Given. Uh, back, to, I think we're still on page 29, accounting services. I wondered if, um, um, Ken, if you could clarify, you had mentioned that a position uh, in accounting services w wouldn't possibly be filled uh, to the new year. Uh, however, it's not budgeted for at all, so are you actually planning for that position not to be filled at all in 2015? Well, it's currently in the budget, and yes, we are currently going to leave it unfilled for a good portion of 2015 until we determine where the needs are because we've reorganized the department we have new staff in there and once we see where the duties fall and then we will know what properly the position is and the skills required for it so it would be either either later 15 or early 16 would be the plan okay, okay. go ahead mr anderson Back to the common services budget, you'll notice a fairly large increase in 15 and the major part of the increase is really insurance. And our insurance provider is the service arm of AUMA and they've told us a 12% increase for 2015. So that's $122,000 of that coverage is related to that. And we were, and as also, as I mentioned, we've moved all the postage there as well as the photocopying within this building just to minimize red tape. Would you be able to show the slide? Sure, so just council members, I, uh, I'm also reading, so I can see my screen here, so please ring in if you have a question or you want to catch something. That way I can recognize you. So. And, and so, Ken, also just, um, so the slide is appreciated. Can you give me a reference on which portion of the green binder we're in? So I'm hearing a couple different numbers from council members, and so I just want to make sure that we're all literally on the same page. Mr. Anderson, which page? We're looking. See, because the reference to common services and insurance, I just under the legislative services tab. Apparently we're missing a page. It's kind of that explains why I couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Um, so we're missing the common services page. Is that the? Else is in here, I believe. Beginning. Except it's not under the legislative services part. It's under its own tab. Sure. You can put it up on the screen if you wish. Sure, that'd be. So this this would be the page that we otherwise have seen. Maybe a little extra detail. Yeah, we don't, we don't have telephone <laughs> sort of showing anywhere else. But fair enough. Okay. So Ken, can you just uh, just maybe speak to the insurance again? You mentioned that there's some increases in insurance, and just now that we can see those lines, so to see the scale of that. Really, insurance is the largest increase. So that's from 2014. Percent increase going in from 14 to 15, and that's what we've been told by the uh, Alberta Municipal Services Corporation. We've added smaller amounts thereafter. But you see there, insurance proceeds. Those are agencies that we that piggyback on the city and also partake in our insurance, and we cover there. We cover that portion from those agencies. Okay. Thanks very much for finding that one. Yes. Swap, probably swap back the uh, swap back. thing so you can get the presentation. To reset and find our place in the uh, slide presentation for the budget, and, and uh, sorry to throw you off there, Ken, but that's all right. Just clear it up. Are we correct now? Or not? <laughs> this is not going well. <laughs> Yeah, that's the, her. Uh, <laughs> the connecting and unconnecting, there might be a. Let me try and restart it. See if I can get where I want. And probably your function F whatever button. Uh, okay. Let me pull it up now and see what works. Can that show again? There we go. Ta -da. Okay. The next department is uh, Information Technology Services. And this is the group that they have up there 11.75 full time equivalents. Which one? Oh, these are the key services of IT. They provide an umbrella of IT services at the strategic level, providing uh, leadership and guidance on IT-related matters when departments come to them for our needs. They also give advice and coordinate the implementation of software solutions. 
We also provide all the support services, the service desk support, emergency call out. There are, is someone on call all the time. Project management, business process expertise. We also require the security and the data backup off site. Network accessibility and the training and facilitation go through them. Their customers are 18 buildings, three community buildings, including Creative Arts, Curling Club, Dogbound. They have all the staff and three external agencies. We provide services to the RCMP, the Public Library, and the Art Gallery. Those are, the, for example, the RCMP. It's recovered from them, the cost. We actually make money on that one. Here's the, the devices that they maintain. There's a number of phones there. You can see the numbers. It's quite extensive. And keeps growing all the time. Sure. Councillor Rice, you have a... Question. 1175 staff? Well, there's a lot of casual staff as well. <laughs> it have to be. Uh, the, this department is just identifying the number of people that they provide. That they, you know, council no, these, race. Yeah. Just hold, these, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, everybody. There's lots of chatter around the table. Council Rice saw on the slide, same thing that I saw that references that there's 1,175 customers of IT services. I think they counted everybody who's ever worked for the city. Okay. Right? They're not, if you look at our establishment chart, it's 528. <laughs> okay. So IT just put a number. Tough so things up. Well, to reference all the people that they are responsible for ensuring have a connection to the IT services of the city. Here are their staff requests for the three-year, four-year period. One is the service desk agent, which is works at the help desk, with the uh, number of devices and the number of staff increasing and changing. That's really for the help desk, is what that one is in 15. The second, and that person would provide first-level technical support, manage the work orders, tickets, and allow the senior technicians to focus on more complicated matters for resolution. Server analyst in 15, this position would provide assistance and support to the server systems engineer and security analyst roles, be responsible for addressing immediate first level service server requests, installing patches, non-critical troubleshooting, and also enable security initiatives to be implemented in a more timely fashion. The business system analyst in 2018, we currently have a, a person who is a 0.5 FTE, and she does not live in Grand Prairie. She provides support and services remotely. It is planned that she'll retire later in this cycle. So to, to make it a full-time position and actually tra attract somebody to it, we'd add a half-time to that because and there also is the needs because there's always more needs for business systems. So those are the two and a half, requ two and a half FTEs requested for this cycle. Their budget at a glance, you can see 36% is salaries, 27% is software support and licensing, 15% is hardware and engineering, 11% is network services, and 11% is other. And here's their uh, budget for the four year period. So for the first year in 15, you would see the help desk person go on. In 16, there are licensing fee changes of $120,000 for systems. There's also a $15,000 data communications charge that will come into effect. For 17, you would be adding the server analyst. There would also be more licensing fees, an additional $270,000. And in 2018, you would have the half-time position for the business system specialist added as well as more licensing fees. Councillor Rice, you had a question? Is that the Doug Grab? Sorry, is that which? The Doug Grab, you know, where every department has to pay them. Yeah, they do provide, they, essentially it's like fleet. I mean, they pay a rent on it, which has actually gone down in this cycle. Uh, this is the purchasing department. 
Small department, a department of three. Councillor Thiessen, you had a question? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, before we move on, uh, I just wanted to uh, touch uh, base on uh, a couple items. Uh, just going back to IT services, page 37. Um, we have a uh, capital under other direct costs. Now in 2014 it was 971 and then we have a consistent 670 uh, going from 2015 to 18. Which line are we on? Um, just under capital. Other, it's under the tab other direct costs. 837. Just uh, wondering, uh, I like seeing decreases in the budget, don't get me wrong, but I was wondering what what the difference of almost, well, of over $300,000 was between 2014 and 2015 and onward. Well, I'll have the answer for you in a minute. Okay. If I can come back to it in a minute. You sure can. Um, before I before I go, though, I was just, uh, I would just wonder if it would be possible if I could uh, flag the new positions for IT services. That's fine. Yeah, well, we've provided some statistical information so you can see uh, what they deal with, the number of tenders over 12, 13, and 14, just the volume that you, you can see that they deal with. Councillor Rice? Had less tenders issued a higher value, but a five that no one bid on. Um, is is it because it's specialized work? Is it just a, a reflection of where we're at in our community, or like that number appears to be growing? Well, you're right. There is busyness in the in the market, and sometimes you put it out there, and there are no bids on it. Sometimes there's specialty work, and people are there's nobody in the community, or there's there's other organizations that are tied up with larger projects, and there's no interest in it. Sometimes it has to do with the timing in the year when it's put out. So that's why we need to focus on getting it out there at the right time of the year. So then what do we do? Do we, do we just award the work to someone or like what do we do? I mean, if, if we felt the work needed to be done strongly enough to issue an RFP, if nobody bids, we can't go, well, say la vie. You know, usually what we'll do is go back to the department and look at the scope of work that we're requesting, try and find out why is no one interested in this type of work. Maybe rebundle it and then put it back out there. Uh -huh. It could be at a different time of the year as well because if you go out, for example, and start looking for road work late in the year, often you don't get much in the way of a response because their season is booked up for the rest of the year. So it's just a matter of timing and the bundling of the work. Thank you. Mr. Anderson? Uh, here's another one. It's a request for proposals. This is what this is. It just shows you some of the information. And they also do a number of quotes as well. So it's more for your interest. But it just kind of shows the volume of work that goes through there. There is no additional staff plan for this department, rather small department. And you can see that the increases are fairly minimal here. It's really step increases with the staff. Councillor McLean. Thank you, Mayor Kevin. Ken, uh, no, I heard you said rather small department, but it's a crucial department because when all the other departments come there and ask for their tenders or RFPs at the wrong time, it, is, it costs us money in our budget. So that is being looked at quite a bit now, right? As you were saying? Correct. No oversight on that one. The purchasing administrator goes out and works with the various departments because they don't necessarily have the skills for sourcing as he does. So he works with them as well on it. And he's involved in all the evaluations of RFPs, tenders. So he brings that expertise to that as well. Thanks, Kent. And as far as assessment and taxation, here's this group. Uh, what they do is 
had the assess and defend the property values. We have eight and a half billion dollars in assessment. We also levy and collect the tax dollars and provide information, uh, property-based information, both to homeowners and other organizations. They have a staff of 10. There's a manager, seven in assessment, and two in taxation. Here for interest is the growth in the parcel count over the five years. In the red would be the low density residential parcels, which essentially would be your houses. In the green would be the total parcels. So in 2009, it was 23,907 parcels. In, 20, 000, in 2013, it was 24,500. And these are uh, standards by the International Association of Assessing Officers. The standard is 3,500 parcels per assessor. In 2009-10, there were six field assessors, and now there's seven field assessors. So we're pretty much right on line with the where their standards are. There's no additional staff plan for this department. Councillor Rice. To say I, I always found this department to have a really high level of customer service, which I think is really important in, the, in that type of area. And when every municipal affairs comes and does their regular audits, they also command the quality of the work done by the staff. Here is the budget. As you notice, it's going down in 2015. The reason for that is when I talked about legislative services and common services and postage, that has been moved there from here, hence the reduction here. The rest of the years are fairly minimal. The final department is fleet, and maybe what I'll start off with, Councillor McLean was asking about the fleet charges. There's two components to fleet charges. What, it, what they relate to are the rental charges for mobile equipment. And of course, it varies from everything from a, from a fire truck to a pickup truck to, to a mower. So what they do is they break it down by categories or types of equipment, and there's two costs associated with it. One is there is a life cycle put to every type of equipment and what they do is they put an end date to it and the approximate cost of what it would cost to replace it, say it's seven years out, this is what it would cost to replace it seven years out. Then they annualize that charge. So that's a part of the charge. So once a department has a vehicle, there is no impact to their budget and replacement of vehicle. It comes out of the fleet reserve. So that's part of it. The second part of the rental charge re relates to the operations and maintenance costs related to it. What they do is they, they take a category of equipment, they have estimates of what historical costs are for the operation, the maintenance, the fuel, those sorts of charges are, and they assign that to the type of equipment. So that becomes the second part of the fleet charge. So those are the two components, and if it's not used, what happens is it falls into a fleet reserve. And what's been what's happened in the last few years is there were some arbitrary decisions made that uh, just arbitrarily reduced the fleet charges. In fact, our current charges in the current cycle are 20% less than they were in the 2010-2011 business year. So what this does is it brings it up to the appropriate value, and what happens is that they monitor them continuously as they go through it. They update the model continuously so that it reflects the current correct charges. So what we've done is made a correction for something that's happened in the past. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Anderson. Here's the services that they provide. They provide the, as I mentioned, the replacements, maintenance, fuel for the entire city fleet. We also do external agencies, which we do a fee for service. So there is some revenue generation here. We do the RCMP, Alberta Health Services, 
Disabled Transportation Society and the Grand Spirit Foundation. We have the capacity because we also have uh, light duty mechanics and they can service these vehicles and also they can be involved in the emergency type of equipment like the RCMP has, similar to what the fire department has. And here's the number of vehicles that they maintain. There's 378 internal units and 133 external units. When you look at it, you can see there's, there's quite a difference here between light trucks to transit buses to fire trucks to heavy equipment. The staffing changes that they're do looking for is the fleet department is also responsible for the service center. And they have one custodian over there who's been working as a temporary for quite some time. There's two custodians for the building. One of them is a temporary the plan here is to convert this person to a permanent staff. The other two positions are mechanics. The 2016 position would be primarily used in the transit maintenance area. And the one in 2018 would be utilized in the heavy equipment and heavy trucks area. So there's one conversion and two new. And here it's reflected. You can see we go from 27 to 30, two new and one conversion. And here are the operating expenses. I mean, there's two areas. First of all is the shop area. The large increase you'll see going from 14 to 15, as I mentioned earlier, we do know the QP wage adjustments for 15. And with this number of staff, that increase is related to that wage increase. They're fairly smaller increases thereafter. We have a mechanic, two mechanics coming in on uh, later in the cycle. The other side to it, as I mentioned, they also maintain the service center. And you'll see the decrease there. And the decrease is they've recognized decreased costs in utilities. So that's what's leading that. And I believe that's it. I'm open for questions. Councilman McLean. A question for Ken. I still on the flight, the operation uh, summary. I think some ways in mobile equipment, uh, how uh, private contractors run that and make their monies. And I also believe in the operation. What was the uh, percentage increase in the operating? Two types. I'm glad you explained that. I How you categorize the increase in the operating maintenance, say gas and oil changes and fuel and stuff. That was quite substantial. Well, it's, it's based on somewhat historic and somewhat looking forward going into this cycle. So they, they made assumptions and they came up with what they thought was the true amount. Yes. And as I mentioned, if, if these costs aren't really realized over the cycle, if, they're not, if they don't happen, then that revenue just falls into the facilities or fleet reserve is where it falls to. And the fleet reserve is responsible for as I mentioned, everything from fire trucks they replace. So it's it's not as if it's being expended. It goes to a reserve. And the model is constantly reviewed to ensure that the rental rates reflect true value. I still want to keep it red flagged for the discussion because I know you spoke a bit on it, but uh, I don't know what the final product's going to be for property tax increases, and I'm wondering if there's movement in this area, and I believe there could be. So Council McLean is flagging um, fleet charges? Operating, yeah. So, well, for the maintenance so, equipment. So Mr. Anderson explained that in the fleet charge, there are two components that make up the fleet charge. I'm going to flag both of them. Okay, so that's the fleet charge. Yeah. Okay. okay. Council Thiessen. Thank you, Mayor Bill. Uh, Ken. Um, now, in our business plan summary, uh, it didn't mention buses. I saw in your slides that it did include buses. Uh, just a little clarification. Um, wasn't the buses uh, transferred, the bus expense transferred over to transit operations? They're responsible for the programming or the operational side of it. They're actually maintained by fleet, though. Any other questions for Mr. Anderson before we break for lunch? Councilor Rice? 
uh, when we used to have our own welding shop at the service center when we did the renovation did we maintain that yes there still is a welding area over there yes thank you councillor Tarrant. i just had a question on uh I don't know if it's specifically for Ken, but uh, Director Roth brought it up yesterday in regards to the uh, uh, $500,000 contingency. Um, the f it was a $500,000 uh, contingency. Overall. Yeah. Over overall. Uh, is Ken would probably be. Oh, sorry. Person. So, uh, Ken, would you, is that uh, contingency in each of the uh, next four years? Well, there's actually two contingencies here. One, there's a $500,000 contingency in 2015, and that is related to the transition of the East Link operating model. That's the one for 15. The one for 16, yes, there's a 500 there, 517 and 518, and that's really related to the risk of going further out in the unknowns. So as we look at, council looks at emerging issues or there's unforeseen expenses, that's what would be used to offset those costs. And we've been doing that ever since we went to a three-year business planning model. If we don't, if there are no, if there are no emerging issues, if there are no external factors causing costs, then it goes back and it actually lowers down the tax increase. Okay, so for each of the four years, there's $500,000. Correct, but the one in 15 is a one-time so, I mean, sort of the 1 in 15 is already dedicated essentially to what it's going to be used for. Correct. Okay. So there's, it not, doesn't... there's not two 500,000s in 2015? No, because we, we, we know enough of what's going to happen in 15. We're close enough to it that we don't need to. No, I was just getting to the total amount. So, I mean, okay. Well, if, if it's not too late, I'd, I'd like to flag those items, those amounts. Okay, so we'll do that. Uh, we'll do that under corporate services. Okay. Flag the uh, budget contingencies. Are there any um, further questions? Seeing none, then uh, I think we will close for the morning. Uh, it's 11:55 now. Uh, we'll sort of we'll shoot to be back uh, in our seats at uh, 10 after one again, as we've done in the last couple of days. Uh, or should we make it a little bit more realistic and say it's quarter after? Okay, let's say it's quarter after. <laughs> We'll be back in our seats for quarter after and look to turn on the cameras then. Um, thanks very much. Yeah.